So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Would you pray with me? Father, we come to you in prayer this morning, and in thankfulness that you've brought us here to this morning, this worship, to be with one another and to be with you, and just in hope for all these things that we have on our hearts, the cares that we've brought into this week, the suffering and the struggles that we've had, Lord, we lay them on the table for you here this morning. Would you meet us in this, give us wisdom as we speak and as we listen, and Lord, would you guide us this morning and this whole week. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So we're back in Romans again. Um, if you've been with us the last few weeks, we've been here for a few weeks. Um, so Romans was written by um, Paul, who's a first century follower of Jesus, one of the first. And he's writing to this church in Rome, which is the big metropolis, um, kind of a mix between New York City meets Washington, D.C., meets uh, Los Angeles, meets all these other places come together. And he's writing to these people um, to say, what does it mean to follow Christ? What does it mean to do that in community? And as he hit chapter 8, we're hitting this passage where it just turns a jam over and over and over again. And so as I was going through and studying this, Paul uses two things you might have heard stake out, which were debtors and slaves. And so I wanted to do some research on what is debt and slavery and um, greater addiction look like today. And this was just from about 10 minutes of research. Um, the first thing in debt, which is the first word we got there were debtors, um, not to the flesh. Um, but household debt, the New York Federal Reserve looked it up, and it is up $200 billion this year, up to 17.5. That's not the government, that's all of us. Um, student loans, uh, mortgages, car payments, credit cards, the whole nine yards, 17.5 trillion. That's how much debt households are in. Um, but if you go further and you look at slavery, which feels like it should be a problem in the past, there are an estimated 400,000 slaves in the United States an estimated 50 million in the whole world. And so these are real problems that he's dealing with, but I wanted to go a step further and look at like, what is addiction, those things that feel enslaving to us. And when I looked at addiction, I first thought, I went to a baseball game earlier this week, and so of course I saw sports betting advertisements, so I looked at gambling. Um, six to eight million people are estimated to be addicted, um, either mild to severe addiction to gambling. If you look further at drugs, over 47 million Americans have an addiction to some sort of substance, um, whether alcohol or drugs or whatever it may be. Um, but then even beyond that, if you look at other things that are addicting that feel enslaving to us, um, that we suffer through, if you, um, things that aren't as in the open, things like illicit videos, 11% of adult men admit to feeling addicted to illicit videos and 3% of women. But if you take a step back to something a little bit more common to all of us, at least based on the numbers, uh, when I first was doing research for this, I found 47% of Americans are addicted to phones, or at least admit to it. Um, but then I went back and looked later this week, and it actually is 57%. So it went up 10% in one year for people who say they're addicted to phones. So there's a lot that we feel addicted to that we're suffering through that we'd say, I can't get away from this, and I'm struggling to do that. Um, so much so that it's not just that we're worried about ourselves, we're worried about our children. And 78% of Americans doubt that their children will have a, or their children's generation will have a better future than they did. So as we look at this, we're in a culture where we are struggling with feeling enslaved to these different things, and that we are struggling and worried about the future for our children too, and what that means for us as a society and us as a people. And so Paul here is addressing this in a similar place in a culture that had also lots of forms of addiction, lots of forms of suffering. And so we're going to look at these different metaphors that he uses and the different images that he puts in front of us. So first we're going to look at debtors, then we're going to look at slaves, 
And finally, we're going to look at how he compares us to children adopted and as heirs. So each of those, I'm going to look a little bit, what does it mean to be that? What would it have looked like in the Roman world? And what does that mean for us today? And how will we struggle with that? So starting off with debtors. So debt was really common in the Roman world too. It wasn't just um, the student loans that we have to deal with today. Debt was something that um, was you, as ubiquitous then as it is now. Um, debt was used for um, starting a small business or business gains. It was used in personal payments and just for kind of like credit card debt just to do the daily bills. Um, the difference then was now you can do bankruptcy, which is a difficult and ugly process in itself and you have FICO scores that affect what you can do based on your debt. Back then, if you didn't pay your debt, you were often enslaved to the person that you were indebted to. And so there was this real sense of fear of debt of, I really have to get ahead of my payments or I'm going to be enslaved or worse. And so debt had this real sense to the Roman people of um, this sense of obligation, I have to go do this thing or else, or else. And so as we look at here, what Paul is saying in the first two verses, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. He's saying that we often feel this obligation to follow after our own desires. And last week we talked about how flesh is really talking about our passions and our desires. And so he's not just saying um, we're debtors to the skin on our hands. He's saying we are debtors to those things we desire. And think about that sense of we're slaves to what we desire. That what we desire is so often of what we put in front of our culture of. That's the thing to go out and follow. If you desire um, to have greater beauty, spend all this time and all this money on self-product care and working through skincare and things like that. If you desire um, to get fulfilled in whatever way it is and money, go work harder. If you desire to be fulfilled in all these different things, society says go and pursue that to the nth degree. What Paul's saying is you don't have to do that. We aren't debtors to the flesh and to our desires. We don't have to live according to that. And ultimately, if you live according to the flesh, you'll die. That seems harsh. Is it really going to lead us to that all the way there? But when we look at it, when we follow those desires all the way down their path, they don't have a stopping point. They don't have a restraint. Ultimately, when we follow a desire and we don't, have something beyond it to stop us, to pull us back, it's just going to take us all the way at the risk of everything else. Um, it can look like two. So if you are pursuing money as the ultimate good, ultimately you're not even going to have money because as you take those extra hours of work, as you do that extra task for that extra certification, you spend your time and you put all your things in there, you'll watch your friendships disappear, you'll watch your um, your close relationships, all those things that make life meaningful to disappear. And then that makes it harder and harder to even do the thing that you cared about in the first place, which was getting money. And so by following our desires, it ends up leading on this path to death. But right in there, Paul gives this antidote that we have. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. It's by the Spirit that we'll live. And so we have this, and we're going to keep talking about this Spirit as we go through the passage. But there's a hope there, that the spirit is not is against the deeds of the flesh we talked about last time. And the spirit allows us to be able to live. So how do we get to that point? How do we kill sin with the spirit? Because that feels really surreal and kind of out there of just, oh, trust the spirit and it'll get there. And it's hard for us to engage with that. So Paul goes further. The next two verses, and we're going to start talking about being slaves now. For all who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And so now, Paul's saying again, where it, debt happens, if you don't pay off your debts, it leads to enslavement. And he's taking that step further and saying that debt, that following of that passion is led not to the spot where you just want to go pursue it. You just want to do the thing you want to do. It's the step further now where you feel enslaved to it and you can't get out to it. You're no longer um, taking the first example of gambling. You're no longer enjoying uh, poker night with your friends. You're now rapidly losing money and you feel like you can't get out of that cycle. Or whatever it may be, it's taking that next step to slavery and slavery in the ancient world too. 
was awful. It was not um, the exact same as we see it today, but there were so many ways in which the person who enslaved you still had control over you. Um, any kids you had would be theirs. There were ways to get out of slavery. There were paths out. Um, but ultimately, being a slave was the lowest rung of society and one place that you did not want to go. And so we see that too when we keep working our way down that path and ultimately the thing that we enjoyed becomes the thing that we can't stop doing, becomes the thing that we're suffering through and we just want to get out on it. But here we start to see again that spirit's coming back as that path forward of here's the direction out and it's for those who are led by the spirit, our sons of God. It's that you have not received a spirit of slavery, but a spirit of adoption of sons as we, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And so it's being led by the spirit. It's important to note, too, is that it's not you're being led by the spirit. The spirit's the one who's forging the path forward. It doesn't have to be you. You're not trying your hardest to figure out where is the spirit, but the spirit is leading you forward and pushing you on. And so it's not just that he's pushing us on, but he can do that because we are sons of God. Now, I want to highlight here the son's word that Paul is using is more technical than we give it credit for. Because what happens in the ancient world is sons receive the fullness of the inheritance. And so he's saying all of us are sons. All of us receive that inheritance. And we'll come back to that. But what he's saying, first of all, is that we have been called children of God and so the spirit is able to lead us and we are able to follow the spirit in it and so that addiction that temptation that thing that we can't get away from there's someone who's leading us out away from it but then we get to the last set of verses the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God and if children then heirs heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ provided we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. I want to spend a little more time here on the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So in the ancient world, like I mentioned, heirs were those who had the full rights to what the father left them. Um, and this was often just the first child. The other children got some portion. It wasn't like the will and testament said every kid gets one third or one quarter or half. It was the oldest child got the full share, and then the other kids got enough to get by, basically. And so, as we're looking at this, adoption, though, was this way to be able to move past and to move, pull others into what does it mean to be heirs. And here's where it gets exciting, too. As we look at, Paul is writing here to a group of Christians who were both Jewish, who grew up with this idea of who God is in the Torah, and who were Gentile, those who were, grew up in a Roman Greek society. And Paul's speaking to both of them here. First, he's speaking to the Greeks and the Romans who had this concept of adoption, um, which some of us know of adoption and have experienced that. And it was not all that different. When you were adopted, you received full rights of being a child of that person. As an adopted child, you were able to not only take on the family name, but you had the full rights of everything that that parent left to you. And often this was used at the highest level, so emperors would adopt children to be their successors. Um, high officers would adopt children to take on their post and to take on their family legacy. And they were pinpointing who's the person that is going to really do it. They would choose someone who's a really high performing official or general and say, that's the kind of person I want to be my son. And then they would be their son. So you see this, not only is it um, selective, it's choosing the best people, but they get the full rights. And so Paul here is saying, you are the best person that God is choosing to receive the full rights of heirship with us. And so he's taking us and putting us in that place where we are receiving heirship with God, which is a level beyond what even a Roman emperor could give. But it goes to a second place, too, to the Jewish population, too, where the next chapter over in chapter 9, Paul just lays this out more clearly of, God first adopted the people of Israel to be his children. And so they have this concept of God chose us to be the children of God. And it's not just an individual connection of I'm adopting you as my son, but I'm adopting you as a people, as my child. And so both parts of this, Paul is bridging the gap between the Roman and the Jewish people in this church. 
And on top of that, he's showing that not only is it not one or the other, but there's a personal connection when we're adopted as children, that God is our Father coming towards us, and that there's a corporate connection that God is taking us as a people to be his child. Both of those come together in this passage. Now, adoption can be a hard concept, um, particularly haven't gone through it, and we think through examples we read in literature or of orphans, we think of Harry Potter, uh, we think of Pip from Great Expectations, and we have this idea of adopted parents, your step-parents are, um, can often feel like they, if, in literature, are often distant. In reality, though, adoption is this deeply intimate connection that brings the parent and the child together. And that's what Paul's portraying here. And it's really best described in literature in this book from the 1800s, Ben-Hur, um, which was also a famous movie in the 1900s, which I know were, both of those are previous centuries, but bear with me here. <laughs> Ben-Hur was his, um, written about the same period of time that Jesus was in. And it's about this young Jewish man who gets in trouble with the law, um, really on false accusations, but ends up enslaved. And so enslaved in the same way that Paul has here, to where he's a galley slave, which is the worst kind of slave you want to be. And so he is on the galleys, he's rowing this boat just day after day after day, and the boat capsizes, goes overboard, and he saves the Roman officer's life, who then, in turn, to thank him, adopts him as his son. As adopting him as his son, he no longer is a slave. He now has all the privileges of being a Roman citizen, and a Roman um, official son, so someone with a lot of power, and he has that same new platform, the new voice, that new life that he didn't have before. And the way that we can see that play out here in this passage is similar. Of We were slaves to these passions. We were in debt to these desires that we wanted to do. We could not escape them. We could not escape the temptations that we had. God has called us not to be slaves, to fear, to be children of God. Not to suffer through these different addictions that we have, but to be children with him. Now, this is where it gets hard, too, because some of us are sitting here and we're saying, okay, if I'm a child, why do I still, a child of God, why do I still struggle with this addiction or this temptation? Why am I still wrestling with um, wanting to view these videos late at night with these substances that I can't get a hold of with even just spending way too much time on my phone. Why do I still struggle with these addictions Why, if I'm no longer a slave but a child of God? Um, so, show of hands, has anyone been a kid here before? Or is anyone a kid now? <laughs> so I think that's most of you. There's a couple who didn't get your hands up. We'll talk later. Um, but for parents or children, former kids, um, how many of you were ready to be an adult at age six? How many of you were... How many of you, your six-year-olds, if you have them, or two-year-olds, are ready to be adults? Anyone? Kids, are any of you ready to be adults yet? Okay, one hand. I was expecting at least one. Um, and we feel that way. We're ready to be adults. We want to be at that, that spot now. We want to be completely done with being kids. But that's why the relationship is father, Abba Father. Because he's continually coming to us. And he is building us up. He's teaching us. He's training us. <clears throat> he's giving us the tools that we need to be able to grow, to be full in him. And what the solution is, is not grow up faster. You can't do that. You can't tell your kid to grow up faster. You can discipline them. You can help them and teach them. But a six-year-old is going to be a six-year-old until they turn seven. And same way for us. God is growing us at the pace that he was growing us. And he's continuing to do that. And so then we see the spirit here is that is that process he is as a member of god who lives within us uh, the trinity that we are able to then be led by the spirit out of suffering out of through these addictions and into the path that he has to be children of god and to live into the fullness of that and it's a long process and it is a process but it is a process through which he's calling us as children to be with him and so we see too as we look through this passage we see we're children of God we see that he's called us and that the spirit is living out inside of us and we have this last verse where we go through too 
and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Here we have a few more questions that pop up. And if children, and some of us ask, and some of us know, I don't think I've ever been, would consider myself a child of God. And if that's you today, and you wouldn't say that you are a child of God, but you want to be free and you want to live into this, and Paul, just a couple chapters later, says it's as simple as, um, it is as simple as calling on the name of the Lord. And just like it says here, the Spirit's crying, Abba, Father. We just have to cry out, Father, and say, Jesus, you are Lord. You are the one who has given me the ability to be an heir with Christ, an heir with God. And if we are children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. And heirship also means, too, that we are going to receive, um, we both have received the blessing of being children now, and we will receive a blessing in the future, too. And so we have that blessing now of being children, of living in the household of God and having the Spirit with us. And we will receive in the future, too, that day when all those addictions, all those fears are gone. And we are just living with him in all purity. But it also means, too, that with him we have that heirship as well. And finally, this last phrase he has, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. This last condition Paul puts on it, provided we suffer with him, that can also scare us a little too. We've gone through all the ways that we don't want to live according to the flesh. We don't want to live into those addictions. And then God says, provided we suffer with him. His friends, suffering is also a passive thing. That it is not something you have to go seek out. Does it mean that you have to go to um, the sub-Saharan Africa and um, find an unreached people group? and um, live through that and to suffer through that? Maybe. God might call you to it. But what it certainly means, though, is that as we are suffering through these still pains, what Paul calls in the chapter before, this war that we feel inside of us, the law of our mind making us captive and fighting against ourselves, as we suffer through that, and as we cry out, Father, by the Spirit, what we can do is rest secure knowing that we are children of God. That is the thing that Paul's asking us here. It's not to go um, to the uttermost, though that may be what God calls us to eventually, but to rest secure knowing that we are children of God. As children of God, we are heirs, and as heirs, we are with Christ. And so Christ has given us a spirit as a way to bring that to fruition, even in our lives today so we can rest secure in our suffering and in our difficulties that we are children of Christ. And through that, we will live into what he's called us to. So with that, let me pray. Our Father, Abba Father, we cry to you knowing that we have not done everything that you've called us to this week. But we are thankful for it's not because we have struggled there, but because you have brought us to be children of God. We thank you that you have given us an inheritance, that you have blessed us as children, that we have a future far brighter than we could ever imagine or ask for. Lord, would you guide us? Would you encourage us this week as we look to you? Father, we pray all these things in your son Jesus' name, by your spirit.